one. Um, you're in uh, 175, which is computer graphics, this course. Um, ECS 175. Uh, my name is Ken Joy, and I go by Ken. I don't go by Professor Joy. I don't go by Professor Ken. Professors are those old guys back on the East Coast that wear suits and teach in ivy colored buildings, right? We aren't that way out here. Um, uh, my TA for this course is Sebastian Ng, and Sebastian's back there in the far corner. You're going to get to know him really well, okay, by the time this uh, quarter's over. Um, I have uh, my office here is uh, all the information is on the sheet that you put out, so I'm not going to write it all down on the board too, or it's on this website. My office is uh, 3045 in Kemper Hall. Um, I have my office hours Monday through Friday, 11:30 to 1. And what I'll do is, if you can't make those, I mean, there's always somebody who can't make them. Can't make those, we can arrange something else for you, right? Just write me an email, um, and uh, we can arrange another time. Sebastian's also going to be holding office hours. Uh, he's also a student, right? So he's trying to get his schedule together right now, but we'll have those out on the web uh, very shortly. Okay, there's also a discussion section for this class this evening. This evening, late this afternoon. Okay, it will be held today. Okay, and we'll uh, we'll start going. Um, so um, Sebastian is a graduate student in computer science. He's a graduate. He's working on uh, visualization and computer graphics, and he's been through this class before. He's been an undergraduate at UC Davis before. He's been through the wars. Okay, so uh, uh, tap him. He knows a tremendous amount about this field. Um, and um, and then uh, you know the website is where everything will appear. All your assignments. All the uh, reference materials, everything for this course is going to appear on the website. So log on to the website, make sure it's there. Occasionally on the weekend, this website goes down because it's housed in Academic Surge, not in Kemper, and they take the power down in Academic Surge sometimes. Okay, occasionally it'll go down for a few hours, it'll come back up. You know, you have to wait for a bit, but occasionally on the weekend, this website will go down a little bit, uh, the students have told me in the past. Okay? So this is a course in computer graphics, and I have to tell you what you're, what, uh, you're expected in this class. Um, basically, um, we will have, uh, what we're going to do is study the fundamentals of computer graphics in this class. And 3D computer graphics, not 2D or whatever. We're going to do 3D computer graphics. And the biggest thing that most students have in this class is that this class contains, there's a, there's a couple difficulties here, this class contains Mathematics, because we have to figure out how to move things around in three-dimensional space. So you're going to see more mathematics here than you've probably seen in many computer science courses. Okay, we have to move things around. It turns out it's pretty easy to do. It's all four by four matrices, which is why the GPUs in your uh, in your uh, laptops all do four by four matrices really well. That we can limit all everything to four by four matrix generation or multiplication. And uh, so we've got to figure out how to move things around in three-dimensional space. So we're going to be doing some things like geometry and things like that in this course and doing a little bit more mathematics than you sometimes see. We're going to be doing polynomials. Not hard math, but a lot of math. And sometimes computer science students coming into this course tell me, uh, you know, God, you're doing math on the first day. You're not doing CS. Okay, but you're going to see that. Second thing, to do graphics well, you have to figure out how light bounces off surfaces. Okay? And you have to look at surface models and color models and things like this. This is physics, okay? We have to dive into a little bit of physics here to figure out how light reflects off things and where the color models come from. So you'll see a little bit of physics. And then you're going to see a lot of computer science. Um, we're going to have you build a small graphic system of your own, okay? A, what we call a hierarchical modeling system. And actually take this system and produce some cool pictures toward the end. And we're going to build this up as we go along in the class. Okay, so those are the things that uh, um, that we're going to do in this class. It's going to we're going to move pretty quickly through it. But as part of it all, we're going to have to learn some software. We're going to have to learn uh, how many know QT. I know it's been offered in some classes. You're going to learn QT in this class. If you don't know it, memorize the faces of those people who just raised their hands. Okay. Um, the, uh, you're going to um, you're going to have to learn QT. That's how we get the images up on the screen, put the buttons and sliders and things that we can manipulate up there. Okay, so that's what Sebastian is going to be lecturing on today. Okay, is some QT. We'll provide you with some examples, etc. We're going to be listening. To, we're going to be uh, learning OpenGL. Uh, you can kind of do OpenGL or DirectX. Uh, OpenGL is easier for us. 
than DirectX is. They're both effectively the same, except the calls are slightly different. Okay, but uh, we will do OpenGL in this class. And, and the difference that computer, that I always tell my colleagues in computer science, the thing that we do that's different than most of computer science is that we write our software toward an API called OpenGL or called QT. That's, that's the end product, the thing that we used under, underneath it all. We don't write core all the way down at the bottom at the computer level, write drivers, et cetera, et cetera. We write toward this API. And so we tend to do higher level code in general. And uh, what you'll find is where you're going to write a lot of code in this class. It's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty overwhelming class for a lot of people because you're going to write a lot more code than you do in most other classes here. Okay, but it's going to be code that gets pictures out. The other difficulty people have with this class is the following, is that once you get your pro, throughout computer science, and when I took computer science classes, once you get your program working, you're just about done, okay? Maybe there's a couple little things to change. But in this field, right, once you get your program working, your picture looks like crap, okay? And that's when you have to start working, is after your program gets working. Okay, and those people in this class that decide to start the assignments the night before get killed. Okay, they get killed because it's that last process that takes sometimes 40, 50 percent of the time is to get your picture so that Joy and Ng actually like it. Okay, it'll give you a good grade for it um, because you know that's one of the objectives here. Is this is a visual field? We're producing visual images, right? We don't want them to look, you know, awful. Um, so that's one of the difficulties that people have in this field is that once you get your program working, that's only step one now. Now you have to get the picture looking right, okay? And that's often quite frequently a much, much longer process than just getting the initial program working. So warn it, take, take it as a warning, okay? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you four assignments in this course. The first one comes Monday. Okay, and it'll be due pretty quick, and it's to get up on QT, get going, right? Get your first programs going, etc. It'll be probably three little pieces of of, of uh, programs to do. The second one, we start working on our modeling system, and starting to write our modeling system. The third one, we learn, and we'll do kind of all polygons in our modeling system. Okay. The third one, we start doing curves and surfaces on. Okay. And doing smooth things, much more, much smoother things. And we'll have to get the uh, the coloring system, the shading system right, etc. And then the fourth one is usually kind of a final project that uh, we have to uh, that we do that'll include a lot of of uh, all that we've learned all the way through the quarter. Fourth one is now. How do I do this? The first three are assigned during the quarter. Fourth one's the final exam. Okay, I'll usually give it two weeks before the finals. I'll make it due on the final exam. So everybody loves me because you don't have a final exam in this course. Okay, we do have a midterm in this course. Okay, we do have a midterm and it'll be given about the eighth week. So that's not really midterm, but it'll be given about the eighth week. Okay, what I typically do on the midterm is I will give you out a week before a sample midterm. Okay, I'll give you out a sample midterm, which will look amazingly like the real one, okay? Uh, except it'll be some slight changes, etc. And what I do, I mean, I think of exams also as something that makes you go over the material again. You actually learn the material once you go over it a second time, right? So uh, that that's the strategy here. But I'll give you a, a sample exam. And I'll tell you a little story. I'll probably tell you this again: is that one quarter, uh, teaching the, teaching one of my classes, I give out these sample exams, and I was about to leave for class, and I thought, ah, I forgot. I forgot to make up the sample exam. Right? I, forgot, I forgot to make up the real exam. Right? So I jumped on my machine. I took the word sample out right, and of, the, uh, of the, uh, the Microsoft Word file right, and printed it all out right, and, uh, and gave exactly the same exam as I gave everybody. Okay? And the distribution was all the same. Right, as it was anywhere. Okay, I gave him exactly the same exam. Okay, and so, uh, but what I'm trying to do on the on the midterm is get you to look over that material one more time. That's the purpose, of, one of the purposes of an exam. Okay, the real meat on this course is going to be the assignments. Right, that's where the grades are determined. Okay, and I do two things that are slightly different than most <laughs> dramatic. One slightly different, one dramatically different than everyone else. The dramatically different one is that I don't accept 
assignments until they're complete. Okay, there's no partial, doing it partial and turning it in, getting a partial credit. I believe that in this field especially, you've got to get software that works. Okay, and it's got to be complete. So it's got to do what you, what it says, what it says in the assignment to do. Um, and um, so that you've got to get that last bug out, right, in, the, in your assignments. And uh, what I do is I give you, I allow you to turn them in late, right, but I penalize you, that most of the assignments are 50 point assignments, I penalize you five points a day, right. And a weekend counts a day, and what I try to do is I make the assignments due like on Thursday, okay, and so you get in a weekend almost immediately. Uh, but a weekend counts as one day. So you're allowed to turn in assignments late here. If you turn them in, if you turn them in and they're not complete at all, all we're going to do is write you an email and say, no, nope, not good enough. Okay, we're waiting for the real one. All right, that's one difference that I do that's dramatically different than, every, than everyone else is I don't do partial credit. All right, we want pictures to come out here. All right, that's that's the difference in this course. The second thing I do that's different, a lot different, is that the university set up kind of to. Um, teach you all individually, right? We call it cheating when you look at somebody else's paper, okay, or something. Uh, but in the real world, that's not the way things are done, okay? You learn by collaborating with all your other people. There's a tremendous amount to learn in this course, okay? And what I want you to do is I want you to work, right, as a team, a team, right, against me and get these things done. Okay, I'm going to give you some really wild assignments. Okay, draw the Meyer sundial on November 10 o'clock in the morning on November 5th, 2005. Okay, that's the assignment. And the question is, <laughs> what's a Meyer sundial, right? And you know, you've, what I'm going to do is I expect everyone to figure these out. Now, it's much better if you're working with a group or a team or your neighbor or whatever to do this. So what I want you to do is to feel free to turn to your neighbor and say, hey, what's he talking about, right? How do I do this, etc.? Or if you discover something on the web, share it with other people, right, that you found. Um, you know, you work as a team in this course and talk. If I do my job right, I see little groups of you over drinking coffee at the silo in the mornings, okay, working on some of the assignments. Um, if you work individually on it, it's going to be a pretty substantial workload. You should try to work as a group. Uh, now there's a problem with this strategy, um, and all by the way, all these things I'm saying right now are out on the website. Okay, they're all out there. There's a problem with this strategy in that the university requires that I grade you individually. Okay, and they require that the work that's turned in be your own creation. Okay, so all I require of you is you can solve the problems, you can help each other debug, you can do all these things, but the code you turn in has to be your own code. Okay, not somebody else's code in the classroom that you borrowed to make the program work. All right, that's the only thing I ask of you is, is that you turn in your own code. The rest of the time, talk. I mean, if uh, one of the best classes I ever had was a ECS 177 class. And in that we have kind of, we call it interactive grading. They have to show me their program and how it works. And I went down one night and maybe half the class showed me their problems right, right away. They were done. They showed me them and yeah, it's good enough, good enough. And then that half the class, maybe 10 or 12 people, they didn't leave. What they did was they went back in to the room and they started helping the people who weren't finished yet. Okay. And they were, I heard comments, come on, come on, we got to get this, we got to get this, we can't let Ken win on this problem. And that's the attitude I want to see in the classes if I do my job right, is that these classes all talk to one another. So a lot of work to do in this class, okay, a lot of work. Okay, um, let's see, uh, uh, where's the library? Which one? <laughs> all right, uh, here's the library. Okay, that's the, li that's the library for this class, okay? If you aren't going out on the library and you're not going out on Google and you're trying to find things, right, you're doing something wrong. If you're in that big, huge building in the middle of campus, okay, unless you're using the wireless trying to do things, you're doing something wrong, okay? <laughs> you're doing something, it should be bells and whistles going off in your head, okay? The library is the net on this class. Every single piece of information we need is out there. 
okay, waiting for you. There's a lot of things in Google searches that people don't know, right? If you add this to your search, right? File type colon CPP. Guess what? You only get C++ files back. Really cool when you're trying to write code. I used to look at other people's files. If you put PDF out here, you get PDF files back. When I make, when I make up PowerPoint talks, I qu quite frequently search with file type colon PPT. Okay, and it gives me all PowerPoint files back. It doesn't give me all the cr junk that usually comes with a Google search. Right, you can limit it down. And uh, think about things like this. Uh, you know, it's much better than going, if you're doing the card catalog in the library, right, you're doing something wrong in this class. Because everything that we have out there, all the QT documentation is out there on the web, okay? That's linked off the website. There's a link for that on the website. All the OpenGL documentation is out there on the web, okay? I haven't been in the library in almost seven years now on this campus, okay? But I'm, I'm in that library every single day. Um, and trying to find things. And uh, it's amazing how quickly you can find them, much faster than walking over to, to the library here and walking back, okay? Who has a copy of the book? What's it look like? Yeah, okay, all right, all right. There's, um, I am not a book person, and in this field, there's not many good books, okay? And so about four or five years ago, I stopped recommending a book for this class. And uh, what you should do is if you are a book person, and there are book people in this room who like to look at the books to see what happens, there are some really good books out there, right? But what you should do is find the one that's right for you, okay? There's one called Hernan Baker, right, which is a good, solid book out there. These, again, they're on the website, okay? They're on the website. What I suggest you do is if you're a book person and you want to do this, um, you know, and you want to have a book in front of you, which is, uh, you know, which many people do, that you go, right, sit down at the floor of the bookstore, look through a few books, find the one you want, you know, take a look at the two books that we've got out there on the website. They're kind of the two that everybody uses. And, and uh, you know, buy one. Okay, you can get them through Amazon in a day or two days if you want, and that's fine. Um, but uh, the bookstore here at UC Davis is really, really used to me sitting down on the bookstore, on the floor of the bookstore, and thumbing through books. I do it all the time, right, to see if I can find information or something like that. Um, but also, you can do this entire course through the library, okay? You can do this entire course through the library. Uh, I have an extensive set of notes out there which are going to mirror pretty much the lectures that I do in this class, okay? Um, the, all the manuals and everything else and what Sebastian's lectures will help you get code, started with code. And, uh, and then we go uh, from there. Mostly we use C++ in graphics. Most of the people you, you do graphics use C++. Uh, you can use other things too. Um, but uh, there's also, for most of my lectures and, all, and most of the things I talk about here, there are C++ classes out there on the website that you can download and use free of charge. Okay. So uh, I got tired of in this class of people writing up programs that multiplied four by four matrices together, right? So we give you those classes, right? You can use them however you like. Um, so with all this, there's a lot of information out there, right? But there's going to be a lot of information that comes at you really fast in this class. And we're going to have to, uh, you know, you're going to have to learn all of this. And you're going to have to write some, some, some substantial software as we go along. So. Everything okay? I mean, uh, I heard 45 people in here, and I just counted 63. So uh, um, I assume that there's a, a waiting list or something like that. But we should be able to uh, uh, go quickly um, as, as we go along. So everybody okay with this? Remember this one, right? I mean, most people, it's amazing how many people don't realize where the library is in computer science. right? And it's right in front of you all the time. Uh, I maintain that universities that have always been uh, enclaves of scholars surrounding a library, universities are eventually going to be distributed around because the library is, is the net now, right? And uh, it's becoming more so all the time. 
so uh, um, our library is slowly, you know, slowly dying in staff because there's not enough people coming in anymore. So everybody okay? Remember file type colon CPP, right? Or with me, it's, it, there's also another one, file type colon CAPC. Some people like to put CAPC. Uh, those of us who use VI, right, like to put CAPC there. But uh, uh, this gets you all C++ files that you can look at. So uh, you could take an OpenGL command, right, and you could Google search for that OpenGL command, file type colon CPP, and you'll get a whole bunch of samples of C++ code that use that command. Okay, and you can look at it. So it's a really, really valuable thing to do. <sighs> Questions before I get started? Okay. okay. Ready? Okay, uh, all right. What's a vector space? Anybody ever see this term before? Yeah, what, you want to take a shot at it? Uh, space and vectors. Yeah. <laughs> Close. Uh, you have objects which have addition, um, scalar multiplication, and scalar distri uh, distributivity. Right. The way we think of a vector space is that, uh, that was really good, right? Is that you can take any two things in your vector space, you can add them together. Okay? And you get another thing in the space. Okay? And then you can multiply anything in your vector space by a constant. And you get another thing in the space. Okay? That's all. all and then there's some rules to make it make sense. Right? That's the way I always look, used it. You know, mathematicians always like to say the distributed property, the associated property, the commutative property. I mean, those things are there, just there so, they make, so things make sense. Okay? I mean, you want V1 plus V2 to be the same as V2 plus V1, for example. Okay, you want this stuff to make sense. But in a vector space, you really have these two properties. Right? You have, you have uh, um, two elements in your space. If you add them up, you get another one. Okay? And here's an element in your space. You add them up when you get another one. And most people think of vector spaces as vectors, right? Okay? I mean, you know, we have uh, vectors, right, with the, the things with arrows sticking out. And, uh, um, you know, that's what they think of as vector spaces. And, and vectors, spaces of vectors, are in general vector spaces. Yeah, they are, because you can add any two vectors together, right? And you can use the parallelogram rule and you get another vector, okay? Or you can add them comp component-wise or whatever. You can take any vector and you can multiply it by a scalar and you get a longer vector or a shorter vector or one in the opposite direction if your scalar is negative, okay? And so most people think of vectors as vector spaces, but that's only one thing, okay? And we use vectors in computer graphics all the time as directions, okay? We use them as directions to point at. Um, we're, you're going to see me walking around with fingers sticking out of my nose, pointing at things, okay? One of the very first things we have to do in this class is figure out how to position a camera in three-dimensional space and take a picture of something. Okay, take a two-dimensional picture of that one thing. And placing that camera in three-dimensional space, we're going to have vectors running around. Okay? Well, vectors kind of turn you into something that we call frames. Okay? And frames are important um, because um, they're kind of little coordinate systems that we use. That was a bad. Let's try this one. Okay? It's kind of little coordinate systems that we use. And we run around with different coordinate systems. And, uh, you know, if we're in a plane, our plane has a little coordinate system that we have to manipulate. Right? And so we have to manipulate these three vectors at a time. Okay? Uh, uh, coordinate systems have something that are even, that, that in addition to vectors, though, there's four things with these little frames, four things with these little frames. There's three vectors, but there's also an origin of the frame. If you have a little uh, coordinate system that's running around in your helicopter as you're flying around something, there's an origin to that. And you have to keep track of that origin. And so we end up with things called points and vectors that we deal with all the time in computer graphics. Okay? We deal with points and vectors all the time. And there are properties with these little points and vectors that we use. Uh, for example, um, that if you take a point, here's a point, 
Here's a point P, and here's a vector V that if we take a point, I'm going to put a little hats over my vectors so that I distinguish them. We take a point and we add a vector, we get another point. Okay? We get another point Q, where Q here is kind of P plus V. Okay? Point is called a, a, you can add a vector to a point and get another point. Uh, similarly, you can get a vector, V, by taking two points and subtracting them. Okay? Now we already know we can add vectors over there. We can multiply them by scalars. You can also get a vector by subtracting two points. Okay, it turns out. Um, and there's uh, um, there's one other thing you can do in that you can get a point P by this operation. Oh, uh, let me do. No, let me try draw you one more thing here first, so that I actually motivate it here. Oop. Uh, oh, let me try another thing here. If we have a point P here, right, and a vector V, um, if I take P plus some alpha times V, I can get any point on this line. Okay? I can get any point on a line that goes through here. And you're going to see this representation really um, a lot. And there's a couple ways to think of that. And that, I'm breaking chalk all over the place here. If I have two points, P1 and P2, right, I can say that if I take P1 plus T times P2 minus P1, like this. Now, hang on, I'll get to you. Okay. Now this is a vector, right? I subtract two points, I get a vector. So if I take a if I take p plus t times some vector, I can get all the points on the line here. And you can kind of see in this case, right? You can kind of see in this case that if t is equal to zero, I get p1, right? And if t is equal to one, I get p2, I think, right? p1 minus p1 here effectively. So if t is equal to 1, I get p2. So you're going to see this formulation all the time here. But this formulation actually motivates something that looks slightly different if I say 1 minus t times p1 plus t times p2. Can you see they're the same thing? Okay. This gives me any point on the line going through here, so does this. Okay? And you're going to see this thing over and over again because this is an operation with points and with things outside of points. And it's the only operation we can do with points other than subtract two of them and get a vector is you can do this operation that says if you have P is equal to some alpha 1 P1 plus alpha 2 P2 plus alpha 3 P3. Uh, there could be even more out here, right? Where alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3 happens to be 1. Okay? If you, add, if you put constants in front of points such that the constants all add up to be 1, and these guys do, right? These two constants in front add up to be 1 because the t's go away. You get something called an, this is called an affine combination. And the, the vectors plus the points are called an affine space. Now this word affine is something that probably you haven't seen before that you're going to come across a lot in this class because this is the way we, we figure out um, points and vectors and combine them all together and everything else, okay? So you're going to see this. Let's see, I had a question back here. Go ahead. Um, are those two equations from Q equals P plus V and vector V equals P minus Q, are they supposed to be the same thing? Yes, except they cr if you're a computer scientist here, you take P plus the vector V, you're going to create a, v a new point, okay? Whereas if you take two points and subtract them, you're going to create a new vector. I'm saying is so like those two equations if you try to use you know algebra or something and move one to the other 
yet they can kind of generally do that, but uh, yeah, yeah, it kind of looks that way algebraically. Same thing over there. Kind of looks that way algebraically, but not quite. Well, I was just saying okay. because, like, if you look at it, it would, in the first equation, it would be minus p equals minus b. That's why I was kind of confused. Yeah, um, but in reality, there's only two things we get to do with points. Okay, we can subtract two of them and make a vector. Okay. We can add, well, we can add a vector to a point and get another point. Or we can do these affine combinations of points. Okay? Isn't what, what English is asking is that shouldn't P and Q be reversed in the bottom equation? Oh, thank you. Is that what you mean? Yes. Uh-huh. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, please uh, take Ken's like Ken does not lecture, and it's 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 uh, you know it's not the Bible when Ken lectures. It's not perfect. Okay, please take uh, my lectures with a little bit of grain of salt. I'll do this. So this affine combination, you'll hear me do this a little bit as we a lot as we go along. So let's go over here for a second, and I'll show you. Let's take a triangle like this. Here's P1, P2, and P3. And we create, frequently had to fig, have to figure out a point here. Take any point in the triangle, P. Okay? And how do I write P in terms of the vertices of this triangle? And this is one of the problems we come up against in graphics all the time. How do I write P in terms of uh, the points of the triangle? Well, you can kind of see that if I look at this vector uh, here, if I look at the vector P2 minus P1, right? So let's look at a vector. Uh, look at the vector P2 minus P1 and the vector P3 minus P1, which is this one. Okay? You can kind of see that I can get to P by going up here a certain distance, right? And then going over here a certain distance. So this is, if I, a certain percentage of the vector. P2, P1, and this is a certain percentage of this vector, right? P3, P1, P3. And uh, if this distance here, if say is alpha, ooh, how am I going to do this? That's, I'm going to call this alpha 2, and this distance here is alpha 3. The length here, I can write P as um, I start at P1. And then I add on the vector alpha 2 times the vector P2 minus P1. And then I add on the vector alpha 3 times P3 minus P1. See it? And I get to P. Right? If I start at P1, I add, I add on this constant times P2 minus P1. Then I add on this constant times P3 minus P1. I get to P, I think. And if I look at this correctly, and do a quick rewrite. This is 1 minus alpha, oops, 2 minus alpha 3 times P1 plus alpha 2 P2 plus alpha 3 P3. And if I call this one here alpha 1, right, then what I get is P, this point P inside is alpha 1 P1 plus alpha 2 P2 plus alpha 3 P3, right, where Alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3 better be, I think it is, 1. Okay? So this is something where I can write any point inside a triangle in terms of the points at the vertices of the triangle, okay? Where these alpha values I put in front have to add up to 1. Okay? And it turns out that every point I pick inside has a unique set of alpha values for it. And so consequently, we kind of think of this as a coordinate system for a triangle. Okay? The alphas are the coordinates of points inside the triangle. Kind of weird. Coordinates usually don't look like this, but we think of it that way. Um, you can see that if alpha 1, let's see, if alpha 2 is 0, right? If alpha 2 is 0, then alpha 1 and alpha 3 add up to be 1, and you get a point on the line P1, P3 here, etc. Okay? Um, so it's, it's a cool little system. These are called in the math world barycentric coordinates.
All right, they're called barycentric coordinates, and they're coordinates of triangles. They're coordinates of triangles. But you see here this affine combination. You see this affine combination sitting here. Okay? So affine combinations are kind of cool. Well, they're even cooler. Okay? So uh, let's see. Um, here's let's see. Uh, let me do this. One minus t squared two t times one minus t and t squared. Here's three polynomials. Okay. Here's three polynomials. And uh, um, no matter what t I put in here, okay, I get, I get values out. Um, and it's really set up to have t between 0 and 1 in these polynomials, okay? And uh, um, what do these polynomials add up to be? By the way, uh, 1 minus 2t plus t squared, I think, is that one. This one is 2t minus t squared, and that's t squared. Is that right? No, minus 2t squared. There you go. That's, that makes me feel better. Suppose I add these guys up. What do I get? One, right? Okay. So here's at some point. Suppose I have three points. One, two, three. Suppose I have three points. Okay. And I write P is equal to, a new point P is equal to one minus T squared, oops, P1 plus 2t times 1 minus t, p2, plus t squared times p3. Now, this is an affine combination, right? That's an affine combination because all the coefficients in front add up to 1. All the alphas add up to 1. So it's an affine combination. But what's cool about it is I can stick in any t I want, and I get a new point out. Okay? If I tick in, stick in t equals 0, I get out, I hope, p1, right? Because t equals 0 makes this go away, t equals 0 makes this go away, I get p1 out. If I stick in t equal 1, okay, I stick in t equal 1, I get p3, p3 out. If I stick in other things, I get, right? Something out. Uh, the university's saving money on chalk. Um, I get other things out, and I get a curve, okay? And I get a curve out, which is is actually kind of cool from this affine combination because I can put any t I want in there, okay? And um, these polynomials in front actually have a name. They're called the Bernstein polynomials. If you take a probability class in statistics or in mathematics here, you see these all over the place. Okay? They're called the Bernstein polynomials. And uh, they can be used to make curves. Okay? This one happens to be, you'll see this, uh, you'll see this again uh, in your first, uh, next time, I'll lecture again on this next time a little bit. This one happens to be a parabola. Okay? It happens to be a parabola. Um, the, uh, um, so here's a cool way of generating parabolas. But I can do this again, right? Let me do it again. Here's another set of polynomials. OK? Uh, do you see how I generated this one? Right? I started with 1 minus t cubed up here and t to the 0, if you will. And then as I went down, I added 1 power to t as I went down, and I subtracted 1 power from the 1 minus t as I went down. Right? And then the coefficients in front were 1, 2, 1 over there, and they're 1, 3, 3, 1 here. Right? No, no magic involved. Okay? So that comes from Pascal's triangle. Okay? But if I do this,
I can take four points, okay, and guess what? I can put in t's from zero to one. I think it's pretty easy to see that when t is zero, you get p1, and when t is one, you get p4. Okay, and I put in t between zero and one, I get some curves, okay? Some kind of curve. And it's not too hard to see, it's a cubic curve here, right? Cubes running around. Okay, uh, you, get a lot, you can have a lot more fun this way. You can have a lot more fun this way. You can have P1, P2, P3, and P4, and get something that looks like that, okay? You have a lot more fun with four points than you can with three. Three, you always get a parabola, okay? Um, but I'll show you how you take three, I'll show you Monday how you can take three and make it. In 1972, there was a fellow named George Chaikin who actually lectured at the University of Utah. And he said, hey, I have this cool idea, right? And I'll show you the cool idea. I mean, I have this really cool idea of how to generate curves. And all he was doing, it turns out, was generating parabolas, right, and piecing them together, right? And he could generate these curves by piecing parabolas together, really, in a cool way, okay? And uh, um, that, everybody said, wow, that's really neat. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough memory and computer power to actually do the things you want to do. And then in the 1990s, all of a sudden, when computers became faster, these things came back out as sub what we call subdivision methods. Again, I'll do a little bit on this on Monday. And now we have subdivision surfaces and all those characters you see in Up and Toy Story. Not Toy Story, that wasn't done then. Uh, and some, uh, yeah, it's the last Toy Story it was. But all, uh, all those things are generated with what we call subdivision surfaces, okay, which came from George Chaikin's lecture in 1972. Um, and you can see I have things out there on the web for Chaikin's algorithm and all. So what I want, kind of wanted to show you here was that these affine things are cool. We're going to do a lot of stuff with affine things. There's points and there's vectors. They don't get to freely combine. We have to combine them in only a few ways. You subtract two points, you get a vector. You add a vector to a point, you get another point. Or you, with points, you can do these affine combinations. And these affine combinations give you other points. But it has the caveat that all those coefficients in front have to add up to one, which is sometimes a pain in the neck. Okay? And we use these things over and over and over again in computer graphics. Okay, let me do this one really quick. I've got five more minutes. Let me do this one, and I'm going to blow you away, okay? Not really. Um, here we go. Let's expand this thing out, okay? It's a mess, all right? Let's expand it out, and uh, um, it's going to be a mess here, uh, but it's going to be 1 minus 3t plus 3t squared minus t cubed times p1, okay? Uh, and you get 3, let's see. You get uh, 3t minus 6t squared plus 3t cubed times p2. Still with me? And you get 3t squared minus 3t cubed. Still okay. Times p3 plus t cubed times p4. Okay? Okay with everybody? Okay, this is equal to, how am I going to do this? <laughs> this is equal to 1 minus, don't copy this down, right, 3t, just watch. It's just simple algebra. Uh, it's t cubed times 3t, 6t squared plus 3t cubed. 3t squared minus 3t cubed, t cubed, vector, matrix, right, times p1, p2, p3, p4. Okay? This is a trick we use all the time. You're going to see me do this a lot. Okay? All I'm going to do is take that polynomial thing or something and I'm going to turn it into, this is just a dot product, right? A one by four vector, a one by four matrix times a four by one. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, are you ready for this one? <coughs> ah.
Oops. Okay? Now that... It works, right? If I take this times this, I get that. This times this, I get that. Okay? So, what happened here was that I have this matrix here, which is a constant matrix, same, no matter what T is, right? And I can change the points over here and the points over here, but if I have an engine that multiplies four by four matrices together really fast, okay, and you'll see that I do, because this is what we're going to do in this course, you're going to see four by four matrices to death in this course, okay? Our camera transformation, the really tough thing that we'll do in about week two and a half or three, the camera transformation is a four by four matrix, okay, it turns out. But if I have a four by four matrix engine, all I have to do is modify this thing, right? And I'm off, okay? And I can code this up as a four by four matrix thing. I can code it up in parallel. I can do all kinds of stuff with it and make it really fast. And so here we go from affine to all of a sudden we've got to change these always our math things into computer things, right? Changing this into computer things, if I look at it as far as matrices, is actually easy, okay? The other thing now, the thing that will blow you away is, what was that? What, if I was to ask what the, uh, what the derivative of this curve was, okay? It turns out that there's lots of principles of these curves you'd like to know. Uh, these curves, by the way, are used in the CAD industry all over the place. Your car was designed with them. Your vacuum cleaner, right? The microphones probably in front of you were designed with them. Okay, they're all over the place. These things are used. Um, so what if, what if I wanted to find the derivative of this thing? Okay, how do I find the derivative of this thing? Oh, that's easy. Um, derivative. The derivative of that curve is uh, 0, 1, 2t, 3t squared times this matrix, times that matrix. Okay, all I have to do is differentiate the first one. It come, just drops right out. Okay. And we in computer land love these things that are based. Here I've got this complete cubic curve that I've done, and all I need to know is four points. Okay? And we love it when you can do continuous things and you can drop them down to discrete things, right? Only a few points and do it. We love that in computer, lang in computer land. And that's what these things are good at. So it turns out that these polynomials form the basis of a vector space. Here we go again, right? They form the basis of a vector space. And you can get any polynomial by a combination of these. Okay, usually we think you can get any, any cubic polynomial by a combination of just these, right? But these guys form a basis, right, of that vector space. There's another vector space that pops out. The space of four by four matrices is another vector space. You can add them together, you get two. Right, you get a new one, a new matrix. You can multiply by a constant, you get a new matrix, another vector space. Uh, matrices are going to be a little fickle for us, though, because when you multiply matrices together, it depends on which order you multiply them in, okay, as to the result you get. And that will cause us problems as we go along. We won't just be able to multiply them in any order. You'll see, okay? So lots of stuff today. What I want you to remember out of today's lecture uh, put in the back of your mind, we're doing vector spaces all, you know, 22A, we're doing it all this quarter, right? Everything we do. And then the word affine, put it in your head. That little thing that says we can take points and put coefficients in front of the points, you know, multipliers in front of the points, so as long as the coefficients add up to one, we get another point. Okay, we're going to be using that over and over and over again this quarter. And I will see you on Monday, I think.